my task this, this afternoon is to actually follow up on the presentation this morning where we heard a spectacular presentation about the development of uh, molecules that block a complex system. And great credit needs to go to John O'Shea and the group at the NIH who have really pioneered this area, particularly with regard to Janus kinase. As we saw today, it is an incredibly complex set of pathways. And I'm going to be reviewing for you the clinical development programs primarily with Janus kinase inhibitors and spleen tyrosine kinase inhibitors. I'm listing specifically the companies that I've consulted to involved in this arena, and this is a hot area right now. Uh, I will be mentioning off-label at least the potential use of these drugs in non-labeled conditions. And I've listed a few of the key references, at least the clinical trials that you could refer to for knowledge about this. So this is a simple cartoon. It takes this morning's complex cartoon and tries to simplify this for the rheumatology group. Um, and this is from autoimmunity uh, auto reviews. This is the extracellular signals. And we're all aware of uh, molecules that work outside the cell primarily, particularly the variety of cytokine antagonists that we've heard about today that we've used for over 15 years successfully in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, once there's binding to the receptor, there's the activation of the variety of kinase pathways. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, there has been great interest originally in looking at what was hoped to be a pivotal uh, mediator of inflammation, uh, and by inhibiting this would induce clinical response, that being the P38 MAP kinase pathway. Uh, there's been a lot of interest, obviously, in Janus kinase, and I've had a particular interest in spleen tyrosine kinase. And there's beginning development programs looking at BTK inhibitors, Bruton tyrosine kinase, and the world of cancer therapies obviously changed because of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, we saw the complexity of the human kinome, and again, we're looking at about the variety of basically uh, limbs on the tree or buds on the tree and how complex this could be. And it's easy to imagine that when you're developing an inhibitor that you may actually cross across multiple pathways, and that is a particular uh, 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 issue with regarding to the spleen tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's in current development. And these are the, uh, as mentioned earlier, these are far from selective as illustrated here. P38 MAP kinases, um, uh, many of us have been involved in this. There's been a tremendous amount of development and activity over the past 10 years, but until recently there was very little in the public domain. One would have a suggestion at least that these molecules uh, failed because of adverse events. And many of these studies were done before uh, the advent of clinicaltrials.gov, so companies did not have to report their findings. And consultants, because of confidentiality agreements, couldn't reveal the results of the studies. But I would venture to say that many patients over the past years got exposed to this pathway without knowledge about earlier trials. And if we can base anything upon the recent studies that have been published, at least the molecules that were studied to date, at least in the public domain, the vast majority had extremely disappointing efficacy results, modest responses, but they, res but they were dosed at a level that did not allow for higher dosing because of toxicities that were dose limiting. In particular, a unique type of rash that was seen, almost like a folliculitis with the Roche molecule and elevated LFTs and CNS toxicities were seen that were dose-related. I'm going to spend some time now talking about the one approved uh, uh, kinase inhibitor in rheumatoid arthritis, that is the Janus kinase inhibitor. As we've heard already, it's critical for signal transduction. It's important for lymphocyte activation, function, and proliferation. There are four JAKs, JAK1, 2, and 3, and TIC2, the commercially available Janus kinase inhibitor does not uh, affect TIC2 and multiple disease states, with the first being in transplant. Just a word about transplant. The studies done in transplant 
were at uh, significantly higher doses than used commercially today in rheumatoid arthritis. So if one looks at the transplant experience with the Pfizer molecule, tofacitamib, uh, the doses were 60 milligrams twice a day in many cases, generally in combination with CELSEP. And that's extremely important to note because we know that there are higher uh, risk of viral infections, particularly zoster with that molecule. And we're well aware now of the zoster concern with tofacitamid. So you have two molecules in which viral upregulation can be seen. And uh, the doses of uh, tofa uh, in those studies were significantly higher than we would use today in RA. Uh, there are positive animal models, and most importantly now, uh, positive phase two and phase three studies and an approval in the United States. As mentioned earlier, this is a complex pathway. I just want to briefly mention that when one inhibits that JAK1 at least, there are a number of uh, cytokines that signal through JAK1, including uh, IL-6. Uh, it's also type 1 and 2 interferons and gamma chain cytokines. When one uh, looks at JAK3, you're looking at gamma chain cytokines and uh, IL-2, et cetera. JAK2 is signaling erythropoietin, GCSF, and IL-6. So when you look at inhibitors of these molecules, you should be able to guess at least what some of the therapeutic effects could be, as well as some of the toxicities associated. A specific JAK2 inhibitor has been approved now for treatment of myelofibrosis. Because of its effects upon erythropoietin, if you gave a JAK2 inhibitor, one could expect to see some selected anemia, and that's exactly what can be seen with some of the molecules either approved or in development. If you inhibit JAK1 and JAK3, you're going to see an immunosuppressive profile. Some of these, the profile may look like cyclosporin. And additionally, because of its effects upon interferons, you may see increasing viral infections. This is a slide that we saw earlier. This is uh, a slide that uh, John O'Shea uh, uh, gave to me to use, uh, looking at the various uh, cytokine receptors and the fact that they are bound together so that if you have uh, a JAK1 and JAK3, for instance, gamma chain cytokines and IL-2, JAK2, et cetera. So it's, you need to remember that these are homodimers when you, when you uh, look at the uh, effects uh, in the cell. Tofacitamid was originally felt to be a, a selective JAK3 inhibitor. That was the initial uh, uh, communications about the molecule. But as more work uh, 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 entailed with the molecule, it became clear, particularly based upon some of the side effects seen, that this was not an entirely selective molecule for JAK3. It's preferentially JAK3 slash JAK1 with some effects upon JAK2. And uh, this uh, class of molecules, as we've heard this morning, blocks both innate and adaptive responses. Uh, TOFA, originally known as uh, CP690.550, uh, uh, works here, blocking a JAK1 and JAK3 with some effects upon JAK2, with downstream effects upon STAT proteins. The phase two trials, as I mentioned, in transplant were in combination with CELSEP. The first phase, one first phase two study in rheumatoid arthritis was a dose-ranging study of monotherapy that Joel Kremer presented, uh, I think, about five years ago at the ACR. It was a late-breaking abstract. In that study, as a monotherapy, the ACR 20% response rates were, were over 70%. And I remember when I saw the abstract, I thought that this might be the first molecule, small molecule, that could actually beat methotrexate in a clinical trial because the results were pretty remarkable. Even though it was only a six-week trial, there was already a signal about uh, uh, target uh, toxicity. In particular, there were reports in this initial paper of anemia, leukopenia, and then there were off-target effects of LFT abnormalities. The molecule was originally studied at a dose of 30 milligrams twice a day. As the side effect profile rolled out, it became clear that lower doses of the molecule needed to be studied in rheumatoid arthritis. The problem with the molecule is that it was incredibly effective even at the next set of lower doses. So eventually, uh, Pfizer, the sponsor, needed to do a dose-ranging study with the lowest dose being one milligram. To get approval by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, 
you not only have to demonstrate maximally tolerated dose, you also have to show minimally effective dose. They demonstrated the 30 twice a day was obviously the maximum tolerated dose and would not be acceptable in rheumatoid disease. The next dosing looked at 20, 15, and 20 milligrams. Uh, in their dose ranging studies, the one didn't work at all. The three had some moderate or modest efficacy. The five and 10 were quite similar, and 15 had a little greater efficacy, but more adverse events. So that led to the decision of moving the five and 10 milligram dose forward in phase three studies. The once a day dosing at 20 milligrams once a day was not as effective as the twice a day dosing regimen. Uh, the phase three program is by far the largest phase three program that I've ever seen in the development of a drug for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there were essentially uh, uh, six programs that were initiated with multiple thousands of patients, and I'm gonna briefly review them. It's a monotherapy study, combination with DMARD trial, structural damage study. What's most important, I think, for those of us who, who see patients is the results in the TNF failure population, uh, combination with methotrexate with an anti-TNF anchor, which is uh, required by the European authorities, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute, and then the uh, uh, monotherapy study of TOFA versus methotrexate. The uh, first uh, phase three trial published in the New England Journal was a six month randomized trial of the two doses, the five and the 10 versus placebo. Because of ethical considerations at 12 weeks, patients in the placebo arm were advanced to TOFA blindly. Uh, they had three co-primaries, but the way it worked is that you'd have to hit number one, then number two, before you could analyze number three. So the first co-primary is ACR20, the second was a change in HAC score, and the third was a DAS ESR remission. And in this uh, uh, trial, the, uh, co the uh, ACR20, the first co-primary was met, mid-60s versus 27%. There was a statistical difference in the HAC score, but the DAS remission at 12 weeks was not satisfied, which is not unusual. In fact, it'd be extremely difficult to find molecules that are gonna meet a DAS remission at 12 weeks. In this initial study, they reported an increase in LDL, which would not be unexpected based upon our experience with tozolizumab and its increase in lipids. Um, there was serious infections in six patients, and this study confirmed the first uh, phase two program. The second trial was a large international trial uh, of patients who were on background DMARDs, so close to 800 patients, more than eight years of disease. Um, the sponsor elected to move their trial program uh, outside of exclusively North America and Western Europe, which I wanna highlight. This is one of the first programs that actively recruited patients from China, Thailand, India, Korea. And in fact, about a third of the patients in this study actually came from the Far East, which I think is important to note when we start to review the adverse event profile. Um, it did achieve its primary endpoint of ACR20, uh, mid 50% range versus 30% with placebo. Uh, this is that uh, the uh, remission rate was at six months where it does achieve a, a statistical increase in DAS remission and improvement in HAC. They had four opportunistic infections, a case of TB from China and a case of TB from, uh, from uh, 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 Thailand a case of cryptococcosis in Australia, crypto is endemic in Australia, and a case of zoster in Finland. And they reported laboratory abnormalities that were seen in the phase two program of neutropenia, elevated serum creatinine, which I'll come back to, and we heard a little bit about today, as well as lipid elevation. In patients who fail an anti-TNF therapy, um, which I think is an important clinical subgroup, because that's primarily where many of us would use a new therapy. The response rates are almost identical to every other new therapy that's been seen. One of the challenges we have in rheumatoid arthritis now is that in patients who are failing the first biologic, the response rate with the second different mechanism of action or even the same, a molecule in the same class, the response rates are no more than 50%. So it's irrespective of which pathway you block in this population of patients, 
we have basically had set a ceiling effect with regard to response. So you're looking at 48% versus 24% in patients who fail at least one anti-TNF therapy. In the x-ray study um, of close to 800 patients, um, the molecule was clinically effective. Uh, ACR 20s in patients on a background of methotrexate in the upper 50s, low 60%, 25% with placebo. There was a statistical Im improvement in HAC score. And in this initial analysis done by uh, the academic investigators and the sponsor, there was a, a significant impact upon the total SHARP score at the 10 milligram dose, but it was not achieved by the 5 milligram. Now, I want you to remember this when I review for you how the FDA interpreted this data in a minute. So this is the presentation from the FDA, which is on their website. Uh, this is the analysis. This is a probability plot, and I think all of us would agree that the methotrexate plus placebo group, the TOFA-5 or the TOFA-10 plus methotrexate for the vast majority of patients are absolutely identical. Uh, and as we heard earlier today, one of the challenges now in the x-ray study is that we're not seeing the progression rates in the population on background methotrexate plus placebo. Close to 80% of the patients on methotrexate alone did not progress in the course of this study. Remembering that at 12 weeks out, patients could go to active therapy. At 24, 24 is the end point, and then the FDA requires an additional 24 weeks to ensure that the active group is maintaining a similar curve. When the FDA analysis, uh, they actually interpreted the data as that the five not being statistically different or the 10 statistically different than placebo. There's some question about eliminating some of the outliers. And in any case, the label was then given. Uh, there was no label given for x-ray progression. In fact, this is not the first study that's had this problem with regard to lack of inability to distinguish uh, an active therapy clinically from patients on background methotrexate plus placebo. Uh, in the uh, trial of TOFA versus methotrexate, the monotherapy study that was presented at ACR this year, in which the primary endpoint was actually an ACR 70, uh, methotrexate was not, a, a, this should be a methotrexate, not placebo, methotrexate was not as good as TOFA, and TOFA 76% ACR 20s with the 10 and 51% uh, with the placebo and there was a significant uh, difference in x-ray activity. I should note that in submission to the European authorities, um, Pfizer uh, has disclosed that this uh, x-ray data was available to the European authorities at the time they reviewed their package. Uh, this was a secondary submission. This data was not available to the FDA at the time they reviewed uh, the TOFA package for x-ray progression. So in this study, TOFA beat methotrexate as a monotherapy, both clinically and beat methotrexate with regard to structural claim. There are, other ant there are other JAK inhibitors currently in development. This is the Insight Lily molecule, um, and there's a dose range response, obviously. The eight milligram is slightly better than the four, and both are better than the two. Adverse events included decrease in hemoglobin, uh, with more anemia being seen, in the eight milligram dose, as well as an increase in LDL. So you know automatically looking at this, that this molecule has effects upon JAK2. Because of this, the eight milligram dose is not being carried forward in the phase three program. Their phase three program is actively underway now, uh, looking at the molecule at lower doses. Vertex has reported their initial study. They believe they have a more selective JAK3 inhibitor. But with all of these therapies, until you get into larger clinical trials uh, and look at uh, uh, more studies, I'm not completely convinced that this is going to be a, a completely selective JAK3. They report very similar clinical responses to what we see with all of these therapies. Uh, these are monotherapy patients, not on background methotrexate. They did not report a decline in hemoglobin, which is the reason they justify that, as well as a, uh, some uh, what they believe are JAK3 dependent biomarker studies, but I would caution you to uh, wait for larger studies to be done. There are positive studies of 
JAK3, uh, of JAK inhibitors in psoriasis with the Pfizer molecule, the greatest efficacy was seen at the 15 milligram twice a day group, but because of adverse events, I'm not sure that's a dose that I would uh, carry forward in psoriasis. They also report positive results in ulcerative colitis, and they had a negative Crohn's study, uh, but uh, many uh, companies are uh, moving forward. There were some questions about patient enrollment in that study, uh, so uh, studies are underway in Crohn's, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and ulcerative colitis. The FDA uh, reviewed uh, the package, uh, and one of the things I'm showing here is the large number of patients, actually, uh, that were presented to the FDA, 1,600 on the 5 milligram dose and 1,700 on the 10 milligram dose. Now, one of the problems is that the control group is exceedingly small because patients in the placebo group were basically opted out either at 12 or 24 weeks. So you don't have a very large control group going forward. Now, what about the adverse event profile? Well, what we have found over large phase two and phase three studies, both in the randomized trials and the long-term experience, is adverse events that were absolutely predicted based upon the mechanism of action of the drug. There is an increased risk in zoster uh, in the, in the numbers that were seen in this trial, the relative risk of zoster is in about the four and a half range. With anti-TNF therapy, it's a little less than two and a half or maybe even lower. Many of the cases of zoster were outside of Western Europe and the US, but even with that, there were cases in both North America and Western Europe. The opportunistic infection data, much of it is clouded by the, I think, the parts of the world in which these studies were done. The cases of tuberculosis are almost exclusively ex-USA and Western Europe. Uh, the cryptococcosis, um, et cetera, again, uh, coming from uh, emerging countries. Lipid abnormalities are um, not infrequent. Just like tozolizumab, about 20% of patients are gonna drive their LDL above 130. Neutropenia is seen in a limited number of patients, and significant anemia is fortunately a rare event, but we're talking hemoglobins in the eight or nine range, generally occurring in the first several months after starting treatment. There is an increase in serum creatinine, which I was particularly concerned about initially. Um, the sponsor has gone on and done some formal renal uh, uh, studies in normal volunteers and do not see any, any impact upon glomerular filtration rate. Uh, more sensitive assays also report that there's a limited effect upon the kidney. This may actually be coming from muscle, actually, um, and it may not be actually a renal effect. LFT abnormalities, like most small molecules, occur, and then the question of malignancy. One of the interesting things that came out of the FDA presentation was a correlation between severe lymphopenia and the development of infection. Uh, as part of the program, they went back and looked at potential markers of infection, and they found that in patients who developed a lymphocyte count of less than 500, uh, the majority of those patients developed significant anemia. And that's the reason why it's now recommended in the package insert that the lymphocyte count be monitored, which is something that I suspect most of us have never done in rheumatology. We've looked at the lymphocyte count and said, yes, steroids lower your lymphocyte count, lupus lowers your lymphocyte count, et cetera, et cetera, but we've never actually impacted upon this. Now, the package insert actually states that if your lymphocyte count drops below 1,000, you need to make a dose modification, and if it drops below 500, you need to stop treatment. So this is something you should be looking at when you monitor the bloods in patients receiving this compound. Um, the FDA spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, this graph, which is a limited number of patients who develop malignancy over time. Now, one of the problems is that there's no control group. So actually, I don't know what the risk of malignancy is with this therapy or with any new treatment. But because of the, the fact it is an immunosuppressive therapy, and we're well aware of the effects of immunosuppressive therapy on development of malignancy, including skin cancer and potential lymphoma, I think we all basically want to see longer term data in larger numbers of patients to see if indeed there is a, whether there is an increased risk of malignancy above what we see with our current treatments. Because of the increase upon lipids, uh, a study was done by the sponsor, 
looking at the impact of lipid-lowering drugs. Now, it so happens that the sponsor makes the largest selling lipid-lowering drug in the world. So when they did their trial, they obviously combined it with that molecule. So this is a very interesting study that Ian McGinnis did. He looked at patients. They did an open study of TOFA um, at 10 milligrams. In those and then uh, at the completion of that, they randomized patients to get six weeks of a torvastatin at a low dose or placebo, and they were able to demonstrate that when you added a torvastatin that you're able to normalize back the LDL, which I think is important from a clinical standpoint. So what about tofacitamide and rheumatoid arthritis? It was approved in November 2008. Its indication is inadequate response or intolerance to methotrexate. I was actually frankly surprised that the FDA gave them this liberal indication. I actually thought it would be indicated in patients who failed a prior biologic as was seen with tozolizumab, uh, but they gave them this indication. They did not approve the, five, the 10 milligram dose. They restricted it to the five milligram dose, and they put a black box on regard to infection and malignancy, and they gave specific requirements for monitoring, including uh, CBC and lipids and LFTs, and as you know, this small molecule is uh, uh, slightly less than the more expensive biologics, but not a lot less. Uh, we've already heard today about this press release, which has obviously generated uh, uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, April 25th, 2013, Pfizer disclosed that uh, the CHMP, which is the group at the European Medical uh, Agency, uh, gave a negative opinion on the approval of TOFA for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, they said that they did not demonstrate a favorable risk-benefit profile at this time and recommended against marketing authorization. And the last sentence, this is from the Pfizer press release, Pfizer intends to appeal this opinion and immediately seek a re-examination of the opinion by CHMP. And I think that's all we can say at this time. The drug is approved for use in the US, Russia, and Japan. So my impression of the JAK inhibitors, at least the ones that are in, available in the public domain, their work is monotherapy. Uh, interesting enough, the monotherapy data actually achieves better response rates than the data we see in combination with methotrexate. Um, now, remember, these are not head-to-head -head studies. We've been urging uh, companies to actually do uh, triple-arm studies to find out whether combination of JAK inhibition plus methotrexate is the same as monotherapy JAK inhibition, uh, and if it's not, that will lead to some very interesting uh, 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 basic work to try to figure out why methotrexate might blunt the effect. This molecule works fast. I didn't comment about this. You start to see a, a clinical effect within a week, and it's my impression that uh, by four to eight weeks, you can predict those patients who are going to have substantive responses at six months. I mean, if you're not responding by eight or nine weeks out, it's time to move on. I mean, this molecule works fast. There's no reason to give somebody six months of the molecule if you haven't had any response by four or eight weeks. It does have a narrow therapeutic dose window. The adverse events are related to the biological activity. And as I mentioned, there are multiple studies going on. Now, what about reducing some of the adverse events? One of the concerns we have is zoster. I, you know, and it is recommended in the package insert that patients get vaccinated at some time as you know, uh, the, F the CDC has liberalized their recommendations on the Zoster vaccine so that patients on methotrexate uh, at a dose generally less than 25 milligrams per week can actually get the vaccine. One of the difficulties is that many insurance carriers, at least where I practice, will not pay for the vaccine if you're under 60. Um, so this is an, uh, an issue that we're dealing with. We're currently in our center trying to vaccinate our patients at the time they start methotrexate uh, or while they're on methotrexate, realizing that once they go on a biologic, you potentially have to stop the biologic for a month, vaccinate, and then wait another month before you can start a drug like TOFA. So it's something for all, all of you to think about. Now, I want to move on in my remaining time and just spend a couple minutes talking about another pathway, and that's spleen tyrosine kinase, or SICK. This is a very interesting molecule. It primarily affects B cell activity. I mean, in essence, rheumatoid may be the wrong disease for this. 
I mean, lupus to me is, is a very attractive construct for this molecule. Um, our, um, uh, Gary Firestein has done pioneering work where he established that sick expression is detected in rheumatoid synovium um, and that uh, 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 sick blocks TNF activation of junk and IL-6 and MMP3 related genes. And based upon Gary's work, uh, a large development program, both preclinical and then clinical, was initiated in rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid, however, was not the first autoimmune disease in which this molecule was looked at. There was uh, preliminary open studies in ITP, which were positive. There was actually a large randomized trial on allergic rhinitis, which was negative. Uh, and there's a large development program with uh, this molecule, R788, fosteninamide, in uh, a variety of hematological malignancies. This is a prodrug. Um, R788 is a prodrug. It's metabolized in the liver to the active metabolite. It's got a half-life of about 13 hours, achieves steady state in three to four days. Um, it requires twice a day dosing, since once a day by itself uh, is not uh, uh, as effective as a twice a day dosing regimen. This is a non-selective sick inhibitor. So I showed you, we saw this morning, some of the kinase trees. Well, if you looked at this one, you'd say, wow, there's a lot of activity in a lot of spots. And indeed, it affects sick. It, uh, this molecule has some effects on jack, has effects on VEGF, and this effects on VEGF may actually be one of the reasons why we see one of the target toxicities, which is hypertension. Um, there have been a number of trials with this molecule in phase two. Uh, I'm gonna, we always point out your best study. This is our trial that we published uh, last year or two years ago. This is a six month phase two program in patients on background methotrexate, close to 500 patients. It was uh, US, Europe, Eastern Europe and uh, South America that participated in this program. Um, at uh, 24 weeks out, the ACR response rates at the 100 milligram twice a day dose was in the mid 60s. This is on a background of methotrexate and 35% with placebo. The 150 milligram once a day group had efficacy, but it clearly was not in the same range. Just like the JAK, this molecule worked at a week. And I'm quite comfortable saying, at least based on this data, that if you didn't have a response by six or eight weeks, the drug just did not achieve a substantial clinical response by the end of the trial. Uh, adverse events that we saw in our phase two program included two, most importantly, diarrhea, as well as an increase in blood pressure. We did some specific analysis, which I think needs to be done in all clinical trials, and now we, we, did, we did a continent effect to see if there was a difference in response based upon where you lived. And interesting enough, because we had seen this in our first trial, is that the experience in Latin America and Eastern Europe uh, was significantly greater uh, with this molecule than we saw based upon the United States experience. And the, however, the delta between active drug and placebo was constant in the mid 30% range. We also in a, had a subset of patients who had failed prior biologics. And in that group of patients, 46% of them responded on the drug compared to 14% with placebo. Treatment emergent adverse events most commonly was diarrhea, which is obviously a concern. 19% of the patients on the 100 milligram twice a day dose had uh, GI, intox GI intolerance in particular. And the big other issue was hypertension. In our first clinical trial, we reported a five millimeter increase in systolic and diastolic uh, blood pressure over the first 12 weeks of the study. This highlighted a concern that as we move to the next trial, uh, we wanted to make investigators aware of and we wanted them to actively treat hypertension. Just as in our earlier trial, there was an increase in blood pressure that was detectable at two to four weeks in the three to five millimeter increase range. Uh, we suggested that patients be treated for hypertension and, and, and by the end of the trial, actually, at 24 weeks, there was really no significant difference in the blood pressure elevation or change from those on drug versus those on placebo. Uh, but um, um, over 20% of the patients 
either initiated or increased any hypertensive therapy during the trial in the treatment arm. So this was easily treatable, but it did require initiation of a blood pressure drug or an increased elevation in, uh, uh, in their blood pressure medication. The second, the third phase three trial is a negative study. This is a, a paper that Mark Genovese uh, uh, is the first author on. It's a three-month trial in patients who failed uh, a biologic. And there are, you know, whenever you have a failed trial, you go back and say, why did the trial fail? Well, there are a couple reasons. One is that we did a two-to-one randomization. So the number of patients in the placebo group uh, were less than in the active therapy group. Maybe that's the reason it failed. Uh, additionally, um, uh, uh, in this trial, we did not require uh, that patients fail only one anti-TNF. In fact, we allowed any number of biologics to come into the trial, and we had patients that had three or four biological failures. There are several studies that report that the more biologics you fail, the less chance you're going to have of responding with the next drug. And then thirdly, in this trial, we said you could get into the study with either an elevated SED rate or CRP. The fourth reason it failed is maybe the drug just doesn't work in that population. And I would have said a couple months ago, well, that's probably not the case, and we'll wait and see what occurs in the next six weeks or eight weeks. So here's what happened. I mean, you know, you don't need to be a statistician here to tell you there's absolutely no difference between active drug at the 100 milligram twice a day group and the placebo group. And in fact, the placebo response was basically exactly what we powered. We powered for a 35% response rate in the placebo group, so right on. Unfortunately, we powered for about a 45% or 48% change in the active treated group, and it was only 38%, so there was no statistical difference. So we went back and we did drug levels to make sure there was no confusion. The patient on placebo, we're on placebo, et cetera. And then we did a, a post hoc analysis which is always fraught with uh, uh, issues. We said, suppose you came in with an elevated CRP, and that was the requirement, not an elevated SED rate. If you did that, your response rate was absolutely how we powered it, 45 versus like 30. And it would have been statistic close to being statistically significant. If you came in with a normal CRP and an elevated SED rate, close to 65% of the placebo patients responded versus 35% uh, uh, or 40% on active therapy. Now, we had MRIs on everybody because this is an MRI trial. And interesting enough, in this group of patients that came in with an elevated SED rate and a normal CRP, a significant percentage of them uh, did not have active synovitis on MRI. And these are read by uh, the group out in, uh, Janance group out in California. They were blinded to treatment sequence. So, and we knew their data before we did the analysis. So um, uh, it appears at least that investigators enrolled patients who clinically had active disease, according to the investigator, but on MRI and by acute phase reactant did not have active disease. I wish I could tell you that these patients were enrolled from uh, parts of the world um, where you might see high placebo responses. This was an entirely U.S. study. 100% of the patients came from the United States. So what about the adverse event profile? Well, I've mentioned already diarrhea. Its infection rate is comparable to what we see with the other drugs. There's not an increased risk rate of a zoster infection. Um, rarely neutropenia, uh, LFT abnormalities in a small number of patients and the hypertension. There is an ambulatory hypertension study that is now being completed to look at uh, this in more detail. So the phase three program is quite extensive, not as extensive as the um, JAK program, but there's a trial in methotrexate incomplete responders. Uh, it's been looked at uh, as in patients who fail the first anti-TNF. There's a classic three-arm study, uh, and uh, there's an induction dosing regimen. So patients get 100 milligrams twice a day and then drop down to 150 once a day or 150 once a day. Uh, uh, once a day. And then there's a monotherapy study. So here's the bad news. So this is the first um, uh, rep, uh, in the monotherapy study where uh, uh, fosdenumab was compared to placebo 
and compared to Humira or Adalidumab, um, uh, it beat uh, placebo, uh, but it was not as good as Adalidumab in the trial. And more recently, uh, Ascara 1, which I'm the PI on, uh, the press release came out in the last uh, four weeks, and they did report a statistical improvement, but I think for all of us that look at this data, it's pretty underwhelming, in which the response rates were 49 and 44 versus 34. So even though the p-value is significant, its clinical significance is pretty muted, and it did not achieve any impact upon x-ray progression. Uh, and this uh, data will be more fully uh, examined, and we hope to be able to present it uh, at the fall meetings. So this phase three study, which was identical in design to our phase two program, did not achieve the same degree of efficacy that we saw in the phase two program, and it's not because of higher placebo rates. Placebo rate is exactly as we had powered it. So we're gonna to have to do some more work in this area. The other two phase three programs are gonna be rolled out in the next two months, actually, and I assume that press releases when they're uh, will be uh, forthcoming shortly thereafter. So with the SICK inhibitor, it does have demonstrated efficacy in phase two, but I must say now, based upon the two negative studies that have come out so far, uh, I'm circumspect about what we're gonna see in the phase three program. It worked quickly. It's very clear that diarrhea and hypertension are the side effects, and we did see this with the phase three program. So we'll have to wait and see, and whether this is gonna be an attractive uh, uh, paradigm going forward remains to be seen. Thank you very much.